Hi, it's Paul Anderson, and this is Disciplinary Core Idea LS3B. It's on variation of traits. In this picture right here, you see me and my father, and we're both wearing our silly looking hats. And if you look at us, we don't look exactly the same. There are clearly some similarities, but we don't look exactly the same. We're not clones of one another. And I owe a lot of that to DNA and inheritance of traits. And so in any population, what you're going to see is variation. And so in these flowers, or in these clams, or in these moths, you're going to see variation within that population. There are clearly going to be similarities, but there are also going to be differences. And so where does that variation come from? Well, the first place that comes from are your parents. Your parents are each going to give you half of their DNA, or half of their genetic information. And so depending on which half you get from your parents, you literally are half of your mom and half of your dad. We also get variation, and this is rare, but we get variation through mutations. And so as the DNA is copying itself, as it's duplicating, occasionally it will make mistakes. And those mistakes in the DNA can cause mistakes in you. They're not all bad. Some of them are going to be helpful. And also you're going to get variation in your environment, depending on what chemicals you're exposed to, what foods you eat, what experiences you have, you're going to get variation in that as well. And so really the two important things that shape an organism are going to be the genes. The genes are going to determine the traits, for example, of this moth, but it's also going to be the environment. So the environment can shape those traits and so it can affect development, the appearance of an organism, its behavior, and it can even affect its survival over time. And so genes and environments work together to make variation. And really those are the two things that contribute to the variation in populations. Populations like these lions, ants, chimps, and aspen trees. And so how do you teach this? Well, in the lower elementary grades, you want your students looking at plants and animals and groups of plants and animals together. And you want to first have them list all of the similarities. So can you find the similarities in these flowers? Well, the shape of the flower, they've got leaves, they've got roots, they've got stems. And so it's, it'd be easier for your students to come up with similarities. What about Tian here? What would they come up with similarities? Maybe the, the material that the shell is made up of, the shape of the shell, the hinge of the shell is going to be similarities. And then ask them to look for differences. So what are some differences you see in these plants? And what are some differences that you see in animals? And that'd be something easy to do in a lower elementary grade. As you move on into the upper elementary grades, you want to be talking about offspring. And so this is a picture of my parents' offspring. So here's my dad and my mom, and this is me, my sisters, and my brother. And so where do the differences come from? We all don't look like clones of one another. We all don't look identical. And so where did the differences come from? They came from the parents. And so each of the parents are giving half of their genetic information or half of their DNA to each of the offspring. And so it depends on which half of their DNA they're giving, and we'll get to that uh, more specifically in a bit, that's going to determine what you look like. But the environment is going to shape that as well. Nutrients you get, experiences you have, are going to create different organisms. And even identical twins, even though their DNA is the same, they're going to be different based on environmental differences. As you move into middle school, you want to get more specific. And so males are giving sperm, females are giving eggs. And what they're giving is half of their chromosomes. And so they're giving you 23 chromosomes from dad, 23 from mom. And those together create the 46 chromosomes that make you. And so sex, sexual reproduction, is going to create variation in each of the offsprings. What else can affect variation? Mutations can. So if you get changes in the DNA that's uh, passed on to the next generation, that's going to cause differences in the proteins and it's going to cause variation. Now some of those mutations could be beneficial. So for example, skin color. Why do we have different colors of skin? It's protecting us from the harmful UV rays. And so that would be a beneficial mutation. Sometimes we'll have harmful mutations, like certain types of diseases. And sometimes we'll have mutations that don't affect our proteins at all, but they sit within our DNA, and we can use those to trace ancestry. And then finally, when we get to high school, we want to get more specific in each of these different levels. And so our parents are giving us half of their chromosomes, but it's not as simple as that. The process of meiosis, and we don't need to go into super detail with meiosis, but know this, and, and, and in this diagram we've made it much simpler. Imagine this is two chromosomes in the parent 
Um, so they had two pair of chromosomes. And so what happens is when they're passing those chromosomes off to their kid, again, they have four here, and each of the sperm or each of the egg would only have two. In us, remember, there's going to be 46 chromosomes here, and there'd be 23 in the sex cells that are created. But something occurs right here, and what's going on is that it, it's crossing over, or you're swapping chromosomes. So in this individual, you're swapping some of the chromosome that they got from their dad with the chromosome that they got from their mom. And when you create sex cells for the next generation, you're going to do that as well. You're going to combine the chromosome you got from your mom and your dad, and you're going to send that off to your offspring. So meiosis gives us variation. And even though you have two parents that are going to be the same parents over time, they're going to have offspring that are going to be greatly varied just due to meiosis. Mutations can cause change in the offspring as well. And so as we're replicating that DNA, as we're making copies, to give to the offspring, sometimes we'll have mistakes in that. And when we get mistakes in the DNA, be it just one letter or sometimes big chunks of the chromosomes, we're passing those on to our offspring. So Down syndrome would be an example of a chromosomal mutation. And then finally, remember the environment shapes us. And so these are two types of hydrangea. They have the exact same DNA. Why is one blue and one is pink? It's because of the pH of the soil. And so even though genetically they're identical, changes in the chemistry can change their appearance. This is a Himalayan rabbit. A Himalayan rabbit is going to be all black. And you might look at it and say, no, it's not. And the reason why is its DNA is expressing a black protein. But if the temperature gets too warm, and that's going to be in the core of the body, it won't be able to express that gene. It won't be able to express that black coloration. And so areas that are cooler, like the tail, the feet, and the ears, are going to express the black, but the other ones aren't. And so we're, we're susceptible to that as well. Our environment is shaping our DNA. And things we do to our body affect our DNA, and we can pass that on to the next generation. And we're just getting into this topic. It's called epigenetics. In other words, you are what you are based on your genes, but those genes can be manipulated by your environment. And so that's a lot, but I hope it was helpful.